Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the University of Michigan Press webinar um, on Writers on Writing. I'm Elizabeth Demers. I'm the editorial director here at the Press, and I am delighted to introduce um, an author and series editor. Uh, first uh, up, our author, Rob Cohen. Robert Cohen is the author of four novels, Amateur Barbarians, Inspired Sleep, The Here and Now, and The Organ Builder, as well as a collection of short stories, The Varieties of Romantic, Romantic Experience. His stories and essays have been published in Harper's, The Atlantic, The Paris Review, The Believer, and other magazines. Among his awards are a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Whiting Writers Award, and a Pushcart Prize. Having taught fiction writing at Harvard, the Iowa, Iowa Writers Workshop, the University of Houston, the Warren Wilson MFA Program for Writers, and the Breadloaf Writers Conference, he now teaches at Middlebury College, where coincidentally our series editor for Writers on Writing, Jay Perini is the DE Axum Professor of English and Creative Writing. Jay is the poet, novelist, biographer, and critic, and is the author of numerous books, including The Apprentice Lover and One Matchless Time, A Life of William Faulkner, as well as his most recent book, Borges and Me, An Encounter. Welcome, gentlemen. It's great to have you on. Hey, Lovely to see you. Great to be here, Elizabeth. Oh, I'm so glad you could come. And I'm really glad that we're going to talk tonight about Robert Cohen's new book uh, for the Writers on Writing series, Going to the Tigers, um, Essays and Exhortations. I have now had the opportunity and the great pleasure to read this book three times, twice before publication and once this week in preparation for this um, evening's event. Um, and I get something more out of it every time. So I wanted to kind of talk about how this book came together, which is it's a collection of essays, Rob, that you actually published in different periodicals. And yet when it came down to put them into a book, what we discovered is that you've created a, a collection of essays that actually has a solid narrative arc about the life of a writer. And um, I, I kind of, I just wanna go through this a little bit with you. Um, the first part of it is really about trying to figure out what you say, what to say as a writer. And you call this chapter, The Principle of Uncertainty. And so I wanted to throw it out to you both to, as you're both writers, you're both, you both teach writing, how do you deal with thinking about what you want to write? Um, well, sure. Um, you know, the book did begin as a kind of hodgepodge of a lot of different kinds of essays. Um, and then as I kept working on it, I realized, no, they're, they're actually essays about the writer's life and the writer's reading life and the writer's writing life. And so, um, you know, it, the final product actually became a, a maybe a purer uh, animal than it began as. Um, and there is, a lot of the essays began as lectures that I would deliver at Breadloaf, uh, the Breadloaf Writers Conference or Warren Wilson, the MFA program. So they were self-consciously designed to be, to address the anxieties of novice writers, aspiring writers, emerging writers, practice writers. And a lot of them began just as kind of, you know, um, um, cries of the heart from my own, you know, uh, venting my own anxieties, um, figuring that if I vented my own anxieties, uh, they would accord with the anxieties out in the audience. And, and sometimes they did, sometimes I think, um, they were just my own anxieties. Um, and and that the principal anxiety um, that all writers face, uh, it seems to me, which which we never really talked about back when I was in graduate school, is just the kind of um, almost debilitating paralysis that that can overtake you when um, the choices you make on the page feel random. And and uh, there's a wonderful essay by Donald Barthelme that really um, got me going on this. It's a it's an essay I always give to my students at, at the college, and it's called Not Knowing. And uh, Barthelme begins, you know, he, he's writing a kind of fanciful story, and he gets to the end of the first paragraph, and he says, uh, "All right, so what happens next?" And he says, "Of course, I don't know." And that leads to a larger discussion about 
is not is is the absence of knowing where you're going in a story or you know you come to a character and it's time to give that character hair and the question of well what color hair what kind of hair why bother even describing hair does it matter is or, or isn't this a fairly random question um that can defeat us and that you know that 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 can feel like a kind of weightless haphazard business and um and so you know especially for a young writer i think uh it's important to let them know that if they experience that anxiety that that doesn't mean that they should you know that they have to quit and go to law school um it means that they're experiencing what all artists experience and the difference between a quote unquote successful artist and a younger artist can just be that the quote unquote successful artist expects to have that feeling, expects to have that anxiety, expects not to quite know what they're doing in their first draft and expects to dig in and have to work it through so that it no longer feels random by the third draft or the fifth draft or the eighth draft. Um, that seemed to me to be kind of the primary most most elemental business of being a writer, which is just, you know, how do you make such decisions in the face of those decisions seeming random? And uh, so it, with my students and with myself, that's kind of always where I begin. And it felt like I should begin that way in, in this book too, you know, that that, that uncertainty, um, that's the writers, you know, that's our terra firma, right? Or our terra infirma that we, you know, we don't know. And we're, we're having to, you know, there's that Silicon Valley line, you know, fake it till you make it. And, and in, in some sense, that's what we do. Uh, Jay, I don't know if your process is similar to that or different, but. Well, I think every writer has his or her own anxieties and I've got mine. And, um, but I, I, so many things in your book really resonated with me. First of all, it's a great book of quotations, let me say. I mean, you have picked some of the, the best. So you can, anyone who wants to just read and just get some good bits, you, they'll find them in here. Uh, quotations from Kafka and Saul Bellow and Stanley Elkin and D.H. Lawrence and Virginia Woolf, you name it. And one of the quotes I love so much, and it seems to resonate with me is, you know, I think it must have been Bello. I can't remember who said it, but you quote uh, someone saying that writers are simply readers who are then moved to emulate what they read. And, and it's that little space that I think, think the writing happens in that space between reading, uh, feeling like, whoa, I, I want some, for some reason, to do something like that. I want to write like, say, F. Scott Fitzgerald. I've yeah. read the Great Gatsby. I've read, uh, you know, you know, one of the great essays that you quote one, and then of course that leads to more problems, because you. I, I loved your, the the way you talked about uh, going to your professor in college and and showing him your work, and he says you got to stop doing this. You can't yeah. write like this. Yeah. This kind of fancy writing. I mean, you. We all want to write sharp, clean, dagger laden. As a, as, you know sentences and it's it turns out it's very hard to do mm -hmm. and i think you convey both the miracle of it and the, the difficulty and the both you're always i think rob uh, straddling difficulty with the possibility mm -hmm. and and they're in almost an equal balance on every page anxiety and exultation you know essays and exhortations as you yeah. call them yeah it's all there you know it's interesting that Rob, you've couched this in terms of of talking to new writers, and yet a lot of the people that you quote and discuss in your book are people who have had incredible careers and are writing it. You know, they're you're quoting them at later stages, and yet they still have these anxieties about what to say, or 
um, you have two different chapters on uh, the one chapter on like finding your own voice, right? Which is where the title comes from, uh, going to the tigers. And then the chapter on on references and how we're constantly making allusions to other writers. Mm -hmm. And Jay just gave us that great um, quotation about trying to figure out, you know, who you are as a writer and where you fit in and, and you know, what you like and then not being Fitzgerald. Um, and I, one of the things that I think is so powerful about this book is that even though you're possibly talking to new writers these are issues that are ongoing for all writers at all stages i'm not sure if that gives us comfort <laughs> yeah yeah i mean i think it should give us comfort just because you know it's um i mean i think it makes us i mean Yes, each time you start a new story, a new novel or something, you're you're starting from the beginning. Uh, but so are all of these people who their books, you know, seem to be admonishing you uh, for your own uh, fallibilities when you look up at them. And yet, you know, I mean, I, I'm, you know, I'm like Jay, I love to read biographies of writers and I, I read biographies of painters. I mean, I love to hear about how much uncertainty how much failure how much rejection how much how much of what we think of when we're at the beginning you know we think of the 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 artist's life or the writer's life as a kind of linear path and and yet when you look closely at any writer's life or or artist's life it's you know it's almost never that way you know um i had a i you know i published my first book when I was 30 and I felt like I was, you know, hot stuff. And then I worked for four and a half years on a very long second book that I could never quite solve. And that seemed, that seemed like an impossibility to me. Like once I had climbed the, to the summit and shown myself, I could write a, you know, a, a decent novel it seemed impossible that I could then go out and write a novel that wasn't quite good. And, um, and of course, that's, you know, that's a lesson we all learned, you know, just because we know more and get better and live longer doesn't mean we're getting better necessarily. Um, and, and in, in the essay that, that um, Jay was referring to, and that you were referring to where, you know, I was talking about Fitzgerald, and I was talking about how writers styles often or artist styles in general not only do they change depending on where they are in their lives but they should change depending on where they are in their lives like that you know that there's there's a danger of getting trapped in your own style or getting trapped in your own manner or you know getting trapped in your own syntax where you can recognize your syntax. You can write a sentence and say, oh yeah, that's my kind of sentence. And there's something reassuring about, about recognizing your kind of sentence, but there's also something dangerous about that, right? Where you stop, where you're then just almost painting by numbers that you've already laid down in, in previous work. And uh, so I'm I'm very interested in all these, you know, there's this wonderful book by, Edward Said on late style, where he he talks about that, and I quote some of Said's stuff. But um, all the artists whose work, whose style of writing, changed radically as they got older, and sometimes it meant that it got less pretty. And um, you know, Philip Roth is a, is a great example. You know, someone who his early work is lyrical and musical and pleasing and fluent and um uh it's like an a plus nice jewish boys prose and then he had that breakthrough with portnoy and then later in his in his life and career he was writing stuff that was often very ugly and just like disfigured by argument and disfigured by rage and all of that and you could tell that he was fine with that. He didn't give a shit about being pretty anymore. And uh, and I find that interesting, you know? You write about Henry James quite a few times, and uh, I've often puzzled, haven't you, over that late style of mm -hmm. his? 
it's an unexpected late style. Yeah. Um, possibly produced by the fact that he was uh, dictating a lot of it. Yeah, I mean, he's dictating. So, but you would think it's impossible to dictate prose that dense, right? Yes. I mean, who, How would who you can do hold that? that in your head? But he yes, seems to go on for pages. Yeah. And you're holding it in your head. But then you, and, and it produces the golden ball. Yes, the, exactly. The dove, you know, how is that possible? How is it possible? Well, I have a private theory about James, which, you know, is, is, makes, would probably make a James scholar shudder. But I honestly think everything with James has to do with his constipation and, and, um, you know, that it, that, that he evolved a style that is, that is like making a fine, beautifully refined art out of constipation, out of, you know, never mm -hmm. quite getting there. And um, mm -hmm. and that's kind of his subject anyway, right? Never quite Failure getting Failure to arrive is his theme. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And well, it's, it's, in many ways, it's your theme too, Rob. You're the failure to quite get there. Yeah. To be something you're interested in, in every essay. It's true. I mean, I think I think it's the, you know, I think there's that problem with where you feel like language can't quite get at experience, like mm -hmm. it can approximate experience or emotion or mood or whatever, but it can't nail it down. Mm -hmm. And so the best you can hope for is that your failed version of rendering experience is interesting, mm -hmm. right? It can't be, it can't be true strictly speaking it can only be a a an interesting or maybe you know at the best beautiful and true you know approximation of something mm -hmm. i mean elizabeth mentioned her that she liked c in sardinia as an essay and i rather love that one too but it's both so grounded in a specific place a rock in the middle of the of the sea in italy and it's also got that haunting spirit of D.H. Lawrence. I mean, it's obviously the title is a play on Sea in Sardinia. Right. And, um, and, and there was a guy who was trying desperately to find his voice. And I mean, it, as he got older and sicker, even he was still quite young. But what an extraordinary career that is. I don't yeah, know how we fit that into our brains. And, you know, what a, what a great... Uh avatar of anxiety you know lawrence's i mean like he is the most disgruntled impossible to please impossible to impossible to satisfy uh mm -hmm. you know writer ever i think and mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. you know and it makes him it makes him feel he he's so intense he's so he wants to get so much life out of life. And, and I think mm -hmm. it's probably partly a function of he knows he's going to die young. So the mm -hmm. stakes are extremely high, but he's, he's trying to squeeze so much juice out of the rock. And, and in right. Sardinia's case, you know, it's literally out of the rock. And, and you open up, I love the way you quote that first line from C in Sardinia, like I got to get on the move or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's so he's so restless. Almost he, ungrammatical, as you say. Yes, exactly. Well, his syntax, his syntax is so nervous and jittery mm -hmm. and all over the like. He's a writer who really who writes so gorgeously. Like his descriptions of anything in nature are so beautiful. Perfect. But he, he's not he's not refining. You know, he's not trying to be beautiful. It's just like he has, you know, he, I always think of him like Van Gogh, you know, where it's just everything is this swirling energy and it's a field mm -hmm. of energy. And um, I mean, he must have been utterly exhausting to be <laughs> with. I, you know, I can't think of anyone I'd less rather have dinner with, you know. So um, for our listeners who haven't may not have read this essay yet it's one of my very favorites in the book and in it rob and his wife travel through the island of sardinia following in the footsteps of dh lawrence who took this trip and wrote this book see in sardinia um and and what i love about it is um well there's a couple things i love one is 
I've avoided D.H. Lawrence my whole life. And now I feel like I need to go read him. Um, <laughs> so, and there's a, other people in the book. Philip Roth is another example of someone I've just avoided reading my entire life. But you make these compelling arguments that I should go read this and experience this. And so I'm, I digress. But um, you're tra- traipsing around the island. You have your own travel woes and issues. And you're following the footsteps of Lawrence and you're like, this is a terrible island. There's nothing to see. It's a dreary hole. I think Lawrence calls it at one point, one of the towns. Um, and yet everywhere you go, people remember Lawrence and love him. And by the end, of, by the end of the essay, I have fallen in love with Sardinia, even though it's a dreary hole. And yet I've never been there. Mm. I just think it's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 well, first of all, you should go cause it, it, it's <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. Um, but but it's wonderful in this in kind of the same way as someone like Lawrence is wonderful, where it's not it's not uh, it's not pretty. It's not like, you know, the Amalfi Coast. It's not it's not uh, user friendly in a lot of ways. It's scruffy. It's poor. Um, there are regions in the interior of Sardinia that, you know, that are still hostile to visitors, you know, where the where the banditti are, are still, you know, on the lookout for intruders. Um, but there's a, you know, there's an energy there, you know, what attracted Lawrence, the reason you should read Lawrence's uh, travel books, particularly, is that he's so interested in kind of pre-Christian culture, you know, I mean, he he so clearly thinks that everything wrong with Europe is this kind of tame, domesticated Christianity, and that and that there was an energy or a spirit, a, a kind of mystical spirit that organized religion stamped out or or smothered, and um, so he goes to Italy looking for that. I mean, he goes everywhere he goes looking for that. He goes to New Mexico looking for that. He goes to Australia looking for that. He goes to Malaysia looking for that. He goes to Wales looking for that. Um, And lo and behold, he finds it because he sort of finds it everywhere because he's projecting it. I mean, you know, he's so determined to see it everywhere that he sees it everywhere. Um, And that lets him complain about how it always lets him complain about how England is the opposite of these places. And so um, you can tell that he has, you know, that he misses England and he has to continually convince himself in his exile that he's right to not be there. But he, you know, it's almost like he protests too much, I think. Mm -hmm. it, people may be wondering why this travel essay is in this book about writing, mm-hmm. but it really it fits into this group of essays that we've actually been talking about, about, you know, copying style to find your own style and and thinking about who your favorite writers are um, and, and you know, making allusions to these, to these writers. And uh, one of the things that really struck me about your book is how you clearly show that when people want to become writers, they're not writing in a vacuum. That, that, that there's in fact maybe too much information coming in and, and too much influence. And, and I love how you talk about that in really um, interesting ways, how you navigate that and how in fact you talk about how other writers navigate that. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, yeah, I think you're referring, there's this essay called Refer, uh, Refer Madness uh, in the book. And it's, it's kind of my response to the internet and, and, you know, talk, I'm, I begin by talking about how long it took me to buy a smartphone, and um, but but it, it, which is just the sense that your fun, when your funnel gets very far open, uh, and you become impressionable to everything, including everything you've ever read, um, that it becomes more and more difficult to go forward. It's kind of another form of the uncertainty principle where um, you're continually you're continually being struck by everyone else's vocabulary and um, and it becomes harder and harder to carve out a space for your own and um, you know I, th- I think you know there was there if we're talking about Henry James there's that wonderful character in the ambassadors 
I forget his name, Little Billum, I think, who goes off to Paris to study painting. He's a painter and he goes off to Paris to study painting and he becomes so enamored of all the great painting that he sees that he gives up painting because <laughs> he he despairs of ever being able to achieve what all of these other people uh, seem to achieve. So, you know, that, that, um, there's a, you know, there's always a danger of just becoming so, uh, uh, so impressionable and so open to influence that, um, that you lose yourself and you sort of drown in a sea of stimuli, which, you know, all of us, I think with our, you know, with our phones and our scrolling, I think, you know, the, the way it leaves your brain, um, to, to try to get back to some single line of thinking after after 20 minutes of scrolling you know is no easy thing it, mm. it rewire i mean we all know this that it rewires your brain mm. rob you talk about um i think three or four times about two kinds of writers this is all connected but you've uh, there's the kind of writer that's outward facing um someone like mailer possibly po possibly roth but you know, but many of the writers you seem to most admire are you call them pale faces, the old mm -hmm. Indian red, red, red man, red face. Who was that? A Philip Rav idea. Yeah. Pale face and red skin. And and then you quote um Kafka with his um, who was many ways an interior writer mm -hmm. if one ever existed, an anxiety-prone yeah. writer, one who was endlessly second guessing himself, if not third and fourth guessing himself. But he has that wonderful um paragraph you quote from the the um the Red Indian essay, where he he wishes he could jump on a horse and ride off into uh <laughs> yeah. Could you, could you talk about this uh, this oscillation that so seems to fascinate you? Yeah, I, I mean, it does. It comes from a an, a, a partisan review essay many years ago, uh, where the, the writer Philip Roth, not Philip Roth, talks about the, that there's two kinds of of American writers. There's the pale faces and the red skins, and so someone like Henry James or Kafka or Beckett would be pale faces, which is to say they feel very indoorsy. They feel very, um, how would we say it? They, they feel kind of East Coasty, if, yeah. if that makes sense. Maybe a little yeah. fussy and a little, a little inward and fussy. A little inward, a little fussy, a little intellectualized, a little, uh, a little, a little focused on the, you, you know, the, the self, we might say, right, and um, and then there's the other kind of writer that that he refers to as you know, um, Redskins, which sort of connects to Kafka's idea of how great it would be to red to be a Red Indian. He says, and and it's mostly just how great it would be to no longer be self conscious, mm -hmm. to to be focused on the mm -hmm. external, to be to be free. And I, I think of that as a more kind of Western. Mm -hmm. kind of writing in certain ways where um you know where e everything feels it's not that things are less complicated but you're not staring into the folds of the self trying mm -hmm. to extract some mm -hmm. you know some some little grain of meaning um but mm -hmm. you're more, it feels more streety and, uh, uh, and active. And, you know, and I talk about how, you know, Jews, for example, have traditionally been more sort of pale faced in their, at least diaspora Jews yeah. in their outlook. Except for Mailer and Roth, right? And Mailer and or, Roth. Or except for certainly Mailer, um, but a writer like Isaac Babel, for example, is very much uh, would be very much the other kind, right? I mean, and and that's what that's what's so interesting about Isaac Babel is that Isaac Babel is there's a civil war in Isaac Babel, as there is in Lawrence between the good, smart intellectual mm -hmm. and the guy who hates good smart intellectuals, right? And you mm -hmm. you feel that. Um, that's what animates Babel's prose is he 
He doesn't want to be the guy wearing spectacles, commenting on things. He wants to be riding with the Cossacks. Mm -hmm. But when he's riding with the Cossacks, he can't help being the guy with the spectacles who's who's taking notes about riding with the Cossacks. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah. you know, some of that's a question of temperament, I think. And and yeah. some of it's a question of of geography and some of it's a you know mm -hmm. and i i think maybe the tension whichever one you are i think you probably think you should be more of the other i always want to be the other yeah yeah i i'm sure mm -hmm. don't you think i mean yeah, you know you probably, probably wanted talking. to be more like shakespeare yeah that's right. you know <laughs> right i, I wonder guess. who tolstoy wanted to be like <laughs> <laughs> well, Tolstoy contains multitudes. I don't know. Did, yes, Tolstoy I mean, is the mountain. He's the yeah, mountain. When Tolstoy read Chekhov, did he want to be more like Chekhov or did he want Chekhov to be more like him? He wanted everybody to be like himself. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's confidence. He did not have those anxieties. No, he, he was one man without those anxieties. <laughs> right. So you mentioned Jewish writers and one of the big parts of this book is how inextricable one's personal self and biography and the stories one tells about oneself um, are from one's relationship to writing and being a writer and thinking about oneself as a writer and one's reading. Um, and you talk about growing up um, and changing your name and um, going to temple and you know trying to sort out all of these things as you're talking about writing and I wonder yeah. if you could talk about that relationship between the self and um, and one's work in a way that I guess my question is is all writing autobiographical even when it isn't um, I, I just found this this relationship so fascinating in, in yeah. your essence certainly the impulses are, you know, the things that drive you to it are, are obviously going to be uh, autobiographical. And, you know, you probably can't help, but whatever you're writing about, even if it's, you know, dragons and stuff, it, 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 you know, it, it's going to come out. Um, you know, in my case, and I, I, I have an essay where I talk about how when I started as a writer, I wanted to be, you know, I wanted to be Thomas Pynchon. I wanted to be writing I wanted, I, I had grown up in a kind of like, you know, suburban Jewish milieu and, um, and it was perfectly comfortable. It wasn't oppressive. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't traumatic, um, in a way that made me, it made it the last thing on earth I wanted to write about. I wanted to get out and write stuff that was, you know, of an entirely different kind of, uh, preoccupation. And then, Part of what happened to me was in my reading when I was when I was in my twenties and and sort of writing my first stories and working on my first book, I found myself weirdly drawn back to some of those Jewish voices that I had turned my back on. Um, you know, the Bellows, the Paleys, the Elkins, the the Roths, um, uh, all sorts of all sorts of writers and um, Isaac Singer. And I started to hear something in the prose that felt, that went really deep in me. It was, you know, it was just a kind of, it was just a kind of tone in the prose that felt like, oh yeah, you know, not only, not only did I grow up hearing a lot of this, but it it's closer to who I really am than Pynchon was, for example. And so, you know, it, it was painful to kind of admit that actually maybe I, maybe I should be playing on that softball team and not on the Pynchon DeLillo softball team that I thought I wanted to be on. Um, and, you know, and it's not like, it isn't that simple. It's not that schematic. You know, we, we have all, all of these voices inside of us, but, um, but that was interesting to me because I really, I, I thought I was growing up and leaving that behind. And, and I think that's a fairly familiar discovery that a lot of writers make that, that at a certain point, the, the reservoir they're drawing from for their work is, is personal and and is fed by springs that only announce themselves 
later on. So, you know, I, I thought I was drawing from all this stuff that was on this shelf, but I also was drawing from all this stuff on this shelf. And, um, and, and maybe that was my own little, you know, tug of war is, was I going to be, I mean, I think it's the tug of war of all those guys. Are, are you going to be a nice, a nice Jewish boy or, or girl, or are you going to do something stranger or less, you know, less congenial or more dangerous or more, more uncertain? Um, and it was only when I wrote my second book, which is a, a book about a half Jew that gets involved with a, a Hasidic couple in Brooklyn, um, that I felt like I could actually turn that into the subject, turn turn that anxiety or that uncertainty into the subject of a book. And so, you know, I resisted it. I was embarrassed by it. When people asked me what I was writing, I would kind of mumble, yeah, I'm doing something about Jews. And I, and I would sort of like turn away because I didn't, I didn't really want to, I didn't even want to believe that's what I was doing. But um, it was a relief to go right at it at that point in my life. But you write so nicely, Rob, about how uh, the, the Yiddish inflection married so well with American diction and mm -hmm. syntax and how that gave an energy to writing that still energizes you. And I mean, it's funny, it's crisp, it's wild, right? Yeah. And it's an amazing combination. Well, I mean, and I think that's what happened in the middle of the 20th century is that suddenly, mm. you know, suddenly American diction assimilated these new, this new register, you know, and, and Yiddish has all this, you know, Yiddish, Yiddish influenced English has all of this kind of humor and music and irreverence to it. Um, that, that kind of voice of Augie March, that kind yeah, of thing. Yes, it's kind of. It's kind of brazen. It's kind of you know you know. Uh, too, there, I, it sounds stupid to say this, but there's a kind of punk rock aspect to it, right? I mean, it's it's very much oh, don't be so hoity-toity with me, Mister So and So, mm -hmm. and um, and that you know, and that view of the world and view of authority, I think, was you know mm -hmm. was. It wasn't even just captivating for Jews to read. It was captivating for, you know, wasp culture to read. And sure. and now, of course, it's it's been succeeded by many other, you know, I mean, the history of the last, you know, hundred years of American literature is assimilating these, you know, new dictions, new voices, new tonalities from, you know, from hybrid populations. And, you know, mm -hmm. everyone is half something at this point. Yeah, the, the hyphen rules. Right. I mean, you're half something, right? Half something, Italian American. Yeah, there you go. Mm -hmm. There you go. You but you don't hear you don't hear Italian Americans, you know, you don't hear Amer Italian Americans going into these long self conscious riffs about, am I Italian? Am I American? Whereas Jews always do that stuff. Uh, Italians don't have much of an unconscious, so it's. Uh... <laughs> Well, Rob, you talk about, um, in the essay on that, about being impaled on the hyphen mm. is the phrase that you use. And I, I found that uh, really visceral. Yeah, well, because, right, because there's so much discussion of, you know, um, in the Jewish American cultural world about, you know, what does it mean? And, and do you want to be called a Jewish writer? And, you know, blah, blah, blah. And are you Jewish? Are you American? And all that stuff. And it's at a certain point, it becomes just incredibly boring to try to parse it all out. And um, and that's what I meant by, you know, feeling impaled on the hype. And like, I just, um, the only, the, the only thing that interested me was the hyphen. I didn't care about either side of that. I just cared about that, that feeling of sort of, of, being in some kind of dynamic tension between two different things. And again, mm -hmm. I think that's that's second and third generation immigrant culture everywhere in the world, right? Is is, you know, the hyphen is part of your existence. You don't there's almost no unhyphenated, you know, 
people I know anymore, you know, on some level. Could you talk, Rob, a little about Stanley Elkin? I think you write about him very beautifully. And there was a Jewish writer, but but that seems a very different kind of Jewish writer to me. Yeah, I mean, Elkin, I mean, I, I write about him just because I had this personal encounter with him, which was, which just, I wrote it, I think, after he died. And there people were putting together a sort of tribute issue. And so this was kind of like my... Um, my eulogy anecdote about Elkin, but he interested me because he was, he actually was, he was not a pale face. He was, even though he was very pale when I met him, because it was towards the end of his life, but he was a, he was a wild, unbridled sensibility. You know, he used to love to say um, during the years of minimalism, you know, he would say, you know, everyone's always saying less is more, less is more. He said, no, it's not. More is more. Less is less. More is more. And that was that was his philosophy about everything. It's give me more. Do more. Be louder. Be funnier. Be, mm-hmm. be wilder. Um, push it harder. And, and yet the world he was coming from was that same. So the world he was coming from was that same Jewish world that I felt like I understood, but he was like the uncle at the wedding who, you know, the main spirited uncle too. He's a little, exactly, exactly. I mean, he's the uncle who sits next to you and he's just muttering the whole time, all sorts of hilarious insults out of the side of his mouth and, you know, and, um, and penetrating all of the veils of politeness. And that, that I found very, and, and in, the anecdote that I, you know, that I tell about him, it's all, it's about having dinner at the Harvard club in this very, very polite setting. And he's in his wheelchair and he is just, he is just unbridled and nasty and hilarious. And, um, and I felt like he was showing me something about how to live under confinement that, you know, I was very young at the time, but I felt like I was filing it away even as I was sitting with him. But there was mm-hmm. something about art he was trying to teach me, and there was something about life he was trying to teach me, and um, mm-hmm. and it stays with me. Yeah. Yeah. I love that particular essay because it's right in the center of the book and it, it, um, and creates a natural break in the book. But mm. for me, who wasn't at that dinner, um, that essay reminds me that, um, everything is not about high art, right? Mm. That there's, that there's a, a groundedness and in a, in a mundanity to, yeah. to what we're talking about as well. And it's, it's a very funny essay, but it's also got a lot of pathos in it. Yeah. I'm it, it, what, what Elizabeth is referring to is that, I'm seeing he had given me a blurb for my first novel and I'm and they seat me next to him because he asked to sit next to me and I thought okay he's going to impart some incredible praise or wisdom about my novel to me and he leans over and he says so let me ask you something and uh and like my entire brain just kind of you know shoots off fireworks of expectation about how incredible what's about to happen is going to be. And then he says, uh, what kind of rent you pay? And I I was so startled by it. It seemed the perfect question in a certain way. Again, he he was trying to, I mean, it, it really was, it was just who he was. It was like, enough about this, you know, enough about this high art stuff, you know, let's talk about, you know, the, in Yiddish, you would say, let's talk talkless, you know, l- let's talk about the real stuff. How do you live? How can you, how do you afford it? How do you live? And, um, and that, and in that sense, it is the center of the book because it's like, you know, nobody is, no artist is working in a vacuum. You know, it, it, you, you have to have a life that allows you to do it and that feeds it and vice versa and and in a way elkin was like putting his finger right on that you know um and again it was like let's not be pale faces here you know let's let's look at the street you know you got to live on the street how are you going to live and um 
and that was great advice, you know. So I want to remind our viewers to put their questions in the chat, and I promise to save a few minutes for questions, um, but I don't want to, I mean, there's so much we didn't talk about, right, that we could talk about um, because the book is is rich and wonderful, but I, what I find so, one of the things I find so great about this book is that you end where you begin with a, I wouldn't say uncertainty, but an unknowing, in an essay that might be about writer's block or expectations, but might be about something else entirely. And I wonder if you could talk about that. Um, sure. Um, the, the last essay is called Invisible Ink and uh, a Mystery. And it has to do with the sense that um, it has to do with what happens when a writer's life is all set up to write. And that to the point where the writer doesn't recognize him or herself unless they're writing. And yet a lot of mediocre and bad work comes out of that pressure as well because, um, because you only recognize yourself if you are writing a book, and because you don't, you may not have an unlimited number of books in you, or you may not have, you may, for, for five years, you may not be onto your subject, or you may not be feeling what you need to feel. Um, that, that, that you have to be able to deal with that pressure and that writers, you know, writers disappear all the time. Sometimes they disappear and then reappear. Sometimes, you know, life gets, in the way in 10,000 different ways. Um, there's often this feeling where, you know, you just suddenly you're a writer who you were kind of vaguely tracking all the time, just sort of, go, just sort of goes off the radar and you don't know what happened. And sometimes you're that writer and you don't know what happened. And, um, you know, I think there's the feeling when you're all, when you're an industrious, productive, good professional person, and you step off that train, whether by accident or on purpose, and suddenly the train of your industriousness just sort of goes, it's, it's a challenge. It's a question of like, well, how do you remake yourself? How do you, you know, do you want to just run and catch up to that train? Or do you want to start a new train? Or do you want to, you know, do something entirely else? And um, I think the older you get in your in whatever field you're in, you see a wider and wider range of the way people respond to that sort of long distance, uh, you know, the long distance loneliness of what you're doing and and the difficulty of not repeating yourself and the difficulty of staying within the concerns of the culture because you sort of age out of the zeitgeist at a certain point. Um, all of these things, I think, can combine to make you, uh, to you know, it's almost like you suddenly look at yourself and it's like, well, what do I want to write now? And and who am I? And that, and I think that's that's a challenge that most writers don't want to talk about until they're like having drinks, and then they might confess it. But it's it's kind of a taboo subject, you know. And I don't think of it as block. I think of it more as um, as trying as sort of renewing your vows in a way, you know, and. Um, I don't know. I, Jay, I don't know if you ever deal with this. Uh, you, you're pretty industrious right. all along. Yeah, I guess so. But I was struck by your essay. I love the quotation from Hugo von Hofmannsthal about um, t about um, taking notes on the way down. Yeah. You know, in many ways, that's what we're doing at the end. We're all taking notes on the way down, and some are publishing our notes on the way down, and some are just sort of sitting on those notes. And I thought that was an ingenious um, segue. Yeah. At the end of your essay. Yeah. I mean, I think, I guess the way I would, I would 
put it is that 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 pressure is something that every every long distance writer or artist feels and there i think there's there's a benefit to acknowledging that pressure and maybe even making that pressure bringing that pressure into what you're doing mm -hmm. um you know it, it, if only to keep yourself honest as you do it to not to you know i don't i feel like you should not be the same writer at 60 that you are at 30 and mm -hmm. if you are that there's something wrong if that makes sense mm -hmm. you, because you don't see the world the same way so you shouldn't write exactly the same way if you try too hard to be your earlier self you wind up like hemingway yeah you can get trapped in your trapped own trapped in a style trapped right. in a in a mindset right. that killed him really right yeah he, he could have a burst sudden burst of flare up of a of, of style as in the old man in the sea but for the most part it's it's pretty desperate mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so the book is really about writing um, and uh, we have a question about publishing. One mm -hmm. of the things you don't talk about is um, something that I think all early career writers and artists struggle with, which is trying to find a publisher, trying to find an agent. Um, and you did mention in this conversation that you'd written this book and it was great. And then, you know, four years later, you sort of slogged through another one. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if you could... Um, uh, the question is, how did you get your first manuscript to catch the attention of a publisher when you were in your 20s? Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, in my case, I wrote, I, I, did, I did some of the classic things of the era. I went to, uh, I was terrible. I started off as a terrible writer, so that, that, that was important to note. And I, um, I went to graduate school. And um, while I was in graduate school, I was writing my first novel and um, and getting kind of hammered for it. And then some penny dropped as I kept working on it, where I suddenly made a leap that I don't even know how I made that leap, except I was part of it was I was unhappy in grad school and my life was falling apart and my girlfriend left me and, you know, a million things went wrong. And maybe out of the, you know, out of the pit of all the things that were oppressing me, I just worked so hard that I probably advanced my development fivefold in, in one year. And suddenly, all of a sudden, I started being able to write a story that I knew was actually a publishable story and it 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 came together kind of mysteriously but once i had it i started sending around stories and getting some of them published in in quarterlies um i got an agent with that first novel that i wrote in graduate school a young agent who was no better known as an agent than i was as a writer and she tried and she got that rejected all over New York. And, but by the time that graduate school novel had been rejected everywhere, I was already deep into another one, which became my first published novel. And, um, and with that book, I, I had a different agent and it was just, you know, it was just a combination of starting to publish stories in little magazines that agents and editors read and I would get little notes from a mostly from agents saying you know I saw your story in you know what Iowa Review or something uh let me know if you ever have a thing and and I I, I don't know if that's still the best model for for attracting agents and editors it, it seemed a pretty organic model at the time I think I think it was easier to get an agent at that point. This was in the in the mid '80s, I would say. But um, uh, you know, I think I think the best entrance, I think the best entry to an agent or an editor is that they see some of your work somewhere, and um, and so anything you can publish along the way. And I was I was taking 
chapters out of the novel I was writing at the time and polishing them up and sending them off to be published. And I found that very useful for me. So, Jay, I don't know if you have- I would just say that that was a world that's so far gone though. I mean, that was a world where there were so many bookstores and there were so mm -hmm. many publishers and uh, there just was a proliferation of writing and opportunities. Nowadays, with the um, diminishment of bookstores, the shrinking of publishers, uh, the I mean, it's almost, it's so hard. No one's interested in literary fiction now, let alone poetry. So it's, um, you know, it's a, I think that young writers today have a very hard road to, to travel. I, f I feel bad about it. I think it's horrible. It's hard, but I mean, people still do it. Still do it. Mm -hmm. They and still so do it. it. Just perseverance and, right. and, you know, you just keep at it. Right. And you got to do it because you, because you'd rather do that than anything else. That's true. Yeah. Where can we find some of this um, fantastic writing among all the clutter of the internet and, and everything else? Well, that's a really good question. What do you uh, read, Rob? What do you really look at? You know, uh, I mean, I, I read the same sort of organ for distribution that most people do. You know, I'll look at the New Yorker, I'll look at the New York Review of Books, I'll look at the London Review of Books, I'll look at certain magazines, Paris Review, Plowshares, um, uh, New England Review, um, Harper's, The Atlantic. Um, I mean, I, I think I think those little magazines and those university supported magazines, the Michigan Quarterly Review is still going. I published a piece in the Michigan Quarterly Review in I think 1987. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so those are still there. And I think and I think with the internet, there's actually a lot more places. I think it's harder to get paid, but it wasn't easy to get paid back then either. Um, but I think there are a lot of places, there's a lot of room on the internet uh, and for, you know, for good, good writing. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to think so anyway. So we just have a couple of minutes left. And I wanted to ask you about the title of your book, Going to the Tigers, which is a quotation. Yeah, that is... Um, that's from Thomas Mann's Death in Venice, and he's he's talking about the hero of Death in Venice, uh, Aschenbach, and um, who's having a kind of creative crisis, and he's attracted to extremity and heat and beauty, and also this gorgeous boy in Venice, um, but he's also timid. And I mean, he's a pale face, we might say, in, in the way that we've been talking. So there's something internal that stops him. And Thomas Mann says something about, you know, he wanted to go, he wanted to go far, I think it's far or further, but not, not too far, not all the way to the tigers, meaning wanted to go to the extremities of of intensity, but not be devoured by them. Or that's how I read it. And um, and to me, that seems like a pretty good uh, mantra for any writer that you want, you know, you want your work to be intense and strange and wild. And and yet your your struggle is that you're afraid of losing yourself completely. And so, you know, we all we all are tethered to. Uh, we're more tethered than we want to be, but we want to get to the extreme perimeter of where we can go, and because um, that's where the most interesting material is going to be, right? That's where the that's where the juice will be. Hmm. Well, Rob, Jay, thank you very much. This has been fascinating and I, I really can't recommend this enough. I loved it. I might read it again. Um, 
please let us know if you have any additional questions, please go ahead and forward them on to us and we will uh, make sure that we get them to our panelists. Um, thank you both very much for being here tonight. It's thank just you. been a pleasure. And I look forward to our next episode coming up in April. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thanks very much, Elizabeth. Bye-bye. Take care.